Good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen, and we're here with another of our virtual events today. And today is a very special occasion. We have Mike Lupica talking about his brand new uh, Robert B. Parker book, Robert B. Parker's Payback. And uh, we we decided to, to enlist a little known up and coming uh, writer, relatively unknown writer to come in and talk to him today. So we got Carl Hyacin to come in and talk. So um, Barbara's at her home office there, and I'm going to be, as usual, kind of monitoring the Facebook page here for your comments and questions uh, for Mike or Carl. So if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the comments field, and I'll pop up about halfway through the program to ask some of your questions. So Barbara, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'm holding up one of our autographed copies of Payback, and I would like to compliment Carl, who not only has joined us, but is thoughtfully wearing a shirt to match the cover. Well done, Carl. Yeah. Eilish. <laughs> it's wonderful. Anyway, uh, what's fun um, is that both authors are noted for their humor, should I say satire, uh, and both of them come from a background of journalism, which I think is one reason they both write such terrific dialogue. And I am not aware of the length of their friendship or, or the ebb and flow of their friendship, but fortunately, I don't need to be because Carl's going to take over he will let you know how this event came to be. Patrick was wrong. It was not actually us that induced Carl to join, but rather his friend, Mr. Lupica. So we're really delighted about that. So Carl, over to you. Well, I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here. Mike is an old, I don't know how long we've known each other, but it's way, way too long to, in, in human years uh, to figure that out. But um, we've been friends a long time. We have the same agent. Um, and, uh, and uh, we're, we're uh, actually really fans of each other. I know most people see two, two writers talking together and they, they understand that they most of the time they can't stand each other. But Mike and I are, have a genuine friendship and that goes back a long way. And I think part of it is the newspaper background. His, 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 he is a, an icon in New York uh, as a sports writer and he's written a, on a, just a disgusting number of books while he's starting out to support his column. And this is, this is one of them. And um, I'm gonna start with something Barbara brought up before we went on the air because, uh, and it's, it's writing dialogue, which the, the whole trick to writing dialogue is, is not making people think it's written dialogue. And our mutual friend, Elmore Leonard was maybe the best that ever was at that. And, uh, but being a fan of Bob Parker's for, for, for all those years and, 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 and digging through the Spencer series and, and knowing his characters. And then, then this, this is a Sonny Randall book, but the voices, are, the voice that Mike projects and the dialogue is so much like Parker's that it's, uh, it, it's astonishing. And I want to ask him a serious literary question. How do you match, uh, the, the, when you're trying to match dialogue of a legendary writer, how do you do it? You know, it, it's funny. And by the way, thank you for doing this. I, I don't feel that I put any pressure on you at all um, to, to be here tonight um i because i it would be wrong we've been friends for 35 years for me to threaten you in any way would have been it, it would have been so <laughs> terribly wrong all right here's i I've, I've told barbara this before i mean we may have talked about this before i pulled the god wolf manuscript off a shelf at, at a brentano's on boylston street in boston when i was in college and and from that moment on i was a a huge robert b parker fan so I, I feel like this voice has been in my head for over 40 years. And then on top of that, we became good friends. Um, I, I was, I, I've been to the famous house in Cambridge that he shared with his beautiful uh, late wife, Joan. And we, during the baseball season, we used to email each other um, constantly during the baseball season. But that voice, um, uh, is is has been such a part of my own interior dialogue for, for a long time, Carl. I I came to write these books so randomly. I, I I was on my way. We were on a vacation in Vermont, and I was up going to meet Taylor and, and our daughter who was riding up there. And I happened to be listening to um, uh, a, a Sonny Randall on audiobook, and 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 loved it and and Kate Burton she's also doing uh, the audiobooks for us now 
And I called Esther, our agent, when I got there. And I said, I'm just curious. And, and I promise you, I, I wasn't pitching myself. I said, I'm just curious how the Westerns got continued, Spencer got continued, Jesse Stone got continued, but nobody ever kept the character of Sonny going. And she said, I'll call and find out. She called me back in an hour and she said, write a sample chapter. And I said, no, 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 no. I have enough to do. I wasn't pitching uh, myself. She said, Michael, write a sample chapter. I got up in the morning and I wrote a sample chapter that essentially became chapter one of my first Sonny. And the, and the minute I started writing in, in a, a scene between Sonny and Spike, her, who was her best friend and like a gay superhero, I just felt like I was exactly where I, I was supposed to be. And, and Payback is now number three. And the response from, from even the hardcore, Carl, the hardcore Parker people has been so tremendous um, from the start. These are the best reviews I've ever gotten for anything I've ever done. But on top of that, it's just a blast writing these characters. I just would find it, if I think, intimidating stepping into those shoes and and uh and i mean he had he had such a distinctive style like dutch leonard did and it, but but it wasn't just the one voice it wasn't just the spencer voice it was right. all of them and they were all different so it's you're managing not just one character but you're managing a whole cast of well-known characters and beloved characters so you know if, if you screw up you will hear from lots of people and uh and, and I, I would just find it intimidating but i mean it does flow so effortlessly i i mean i really would challenge someone to to pick up a, a difference the pace is is just like bob's pace was and and that was part of when we read those early spencer novels you and right. i both talked about this the thing that was just so amazing is how fast you could burn through them yeah. and yet you realized they they weren't as simple Oh no! Looked. And that and that's the, that's the gift that 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 he had was to to make the to, to make the complicated look simple and read fast. Yeah, Sunny is you know she's not Spencer, but the, you know people have called her female Spencer, but she's not. She's more complicated than that. Her life, you know, her life is a lot more complicated than than Spencer's. I mean, he's basically with with a very few exceptions been with Susan Silverman, you know, for 600 books. And Sonny's had a complicated relationship with her ex-life. And then, you know, I had some fun bringing Jesse Stone into it because I could tell at the end of Bob's time writing um, both Jesse and Sonny that he loved the idea of putting them together. And so they've, they've sort of canoodled a little bit, but the, the cast of characters is so rich. And Carl, you know this, I mean, I, you know, I mean, Carl Hyacin is a genius at, at, at bad guys. Uh, your bad guys to me are always more fascinating and funny and, and th than even your good guys are. Th there's been, there, like Tony Marcus, the gangster, in, is, I, I can't, I just look for reasons to put him in these Sorry. books because he's so, Carl, he's so stinking fun uh, to write. And, and, and Sonny and he have a complicated relationship. And, right. and so it's all those intersecting orbits that make this just such a fun job to have, but I, it, I, I probably should have been intimidated by it, but I wasn't. It was just an honor to be chosen. And then once I started, I, 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 I just felt like I knew what I was doing. Well, let, let me also should point out to, uh, to everyone watching, uh, or I should point out that this is not like the only thing you do. You've got so many projects going. You, you finished a book with Jim Patterson. You've got, I don't know, I don't know. It's it's really a pathology. I think you, you need help. What well, a big pathology is the word you were looking for there. I, well, I, I mean, the, this compulsion to be productive, this is, it, you're setting a terrible example for the rest of us uh, as we as we slow down. Um, uh, but but it, what my point is, you're not just juggling those characters and that storyline. You've got other stuff going. And that's one of the hardest things to do, I think, is, is set one thing aside and refocus on this whole other thing in a other, another city and, a, and all the characters. That's that's a, that's a, oh, that would be overwhelming for a lot of writers. But you have that great. And are do you still use those those index cards? And you you have are those were props, weren't they? When when I you know you had all these index cards. You actually plot your books, don't you? I I try to, but then it never works. But if I took 
If I took the laptop now and walked over to the other side of the room, you would see, yes, all sorts of different colored pages and things on and I'm just, I'm not even gonna tell you this, it's a new thing with Jim <laughs> that we're working on right now. And I, I did, I have to confess, I did just ship off the new Jesse that'll be hey, out. See, there. every time I talk to you, you're, 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 you're sending off another manuscript. But it's fun, it's fun, you know it's fun. I mean, I, I it's- it's, it's horrible, it's not fun, it's horrible. It's, <laughs> writing is horrible. How can you say it's fun? It's torture. But it's anyway- torture. Do you think anybody would read Squeeze Me and not say Carl Hyacin had an amazing amount of fun for what, 300 and whatever pages it was and, and somehow managed to survive without certain fans of a certain former president coming, coming after you? And, 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 a badge and, of pride, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when it's going well and when and when it's rolling, it's it's fun in a certain way, but I don't sit there and cackle at the screen <laughs> when I'm working. And you don't either, you're very intense when you're writing. You're, yes. Once again, let's go back to the second, just the newspaper background, because and, and you know this from, from the, the column that you wrote and from the reporting that you did, that there's no, you can't, there's no writer's block in that business. You can't no. have writer's block right. and last more than a week in the newspaper business. So we're conditioned, our muscle reflexes to write, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what, I mean, pandemic, no pandemic, whatever, you know, hell is raining down. You know, our, we're conditioned to go in a room and write, but, but there are certain levels of that. There are, there's a healthy level of productivity, and then there's just a highly alarming level of productivity, which is the category, as I would put you. Well, First of all, uh, let me just say this, okay? And 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 th there's times when I need to say things about Hyacinth and-, and, and Don't. <laughs> yes, I do. He recently stopped writing his newspaper column and Carl Hyacinth was one of the greatest newspaper columnists who ever lived. And 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 I wish that he was still writing a column uh, somewhere. The the fact that he never won a Pulitzer Prize is is a freaking scandal. And and I miss reading the Miami Herald. No, you know, it's true and and and- and it, 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 at one point, you know how hard it was trying for me trying to access your column. At, at, that at, was, uh, don't even get me started. Yeah, yeah, but that, okay, but here, stuff. yeah don't well, get me started. Well, what you just said is so true. We have never, we, we were, our careers have been on, I mean, we've been with Esther Newberg for about the same amount of time. We, we wrote newspaper column from almost, you know, we came into the business. We, we started writing fiction about the same time. But as for the newspaper part, you know this. We never had the luxury of saying, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just not feeling it today." And and, no. and the editor would say, "Oh, really? You're not feeling it today? Well, we have this okay. this space that will strip down the right side of the page or the left side of the page or whatever side of the page it was on." And the other thing that newspaper columns teach you, and you know this as well as I do, they have to have a beginning, a middle and it end. You try to pull the reader in, you have to use dialogue as much as you can. And to me, it is the single greatest, right? The single greatest training ground that you could ever have um, for, for writing fiction. I think, and I think, that, and there's a, there's a, there's certain kinds of street fiction that, you know, you, you, I mean, obviously you work in New York and you obviously, you know, Boston very, very well. And that it brings a richness to it. It brings a columnist's eye. There are scenes in this book, and there were scenes in the, in the first two sunnings as well that were clearly written as if you were a columnist walking down the street yeah. in Boston yeah. with with a notebook in your hand, observing those things. Not, I don't think people. I think that's one of the the great gifts we're given from the business is not just observing and cataloging, but are also the ear for dialogue. Because if you interview enough people, you know that they don't speak in complete paragraphs. Right. And the right. syntax is not always right. And one, if you ask them a question frequently, they answer a different question. So to nail the dialogue, and this is what Leonard was so great at too, the, the dialogue is, is often not linear, or if it is, there's no. subtext to it. Yeah. And, and I think years of listening to people lie to us in journalism, which is what we got paid to do, is you interview most of the time, a lot of the time they're lying to you. And you just sit there and say, that's, that's a nice way of expressing it, but you, it all gets filed away. And, um, and, but I think you got to know the territory, you got to know the streets and the alleys the way you do. And I envy that because I know, you know, I'm not, 
I mean, Miami, South Florida is not a, I mean, you, you get a sense of the place certainly, and that, but it's not a, 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 an old sort of raw bone city like New York and, right. and Boston and, and Philly and those places. Well, it, it's so funny, but now, you know, I went to Boston College, okay, and, and I've, uh, I'm about to, our, my baby girl is about to be my fourth child to go through Boston, she's graduating Boston College in a couple of weeks. They should at least so, name a bench after you or something. Yeah, right? Okay. No, it's, it's yeah. And, 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 but these neighborhoods, I, I've always loved Boston. Carl, when I started writing Sunny, okay, I, I, I put her in a new residence, uh, that's basically a part of Beacon Hill. And one day I, 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 I picked the actual house that I wanted uh, uh, River Street Place. I wanted her to live in, okay? And I'm standing there taking notes in front of the house and, and the woman who owns the house comes walking out and, 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 and she kind of says, what are you doing? And I said, this is like a perfect house from the main character in this book I was writing. And, and she started telling me the history of the house and how it's an old whaling house and everything. And, and those are the situations that you, but I love writing about these neighborhoods in Boston because I've, I've walked them and, and been in them. And that was the one bonus to getting a Boston character like Sonny to write about. Also, you managed to sell a book out of that whole encounter. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. And, 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 but she's looking at me staring at her house and I'm taking notes. And, but that, again, it goes back to the columnist in us. Okay. That, that we want to get as much of the detail right. Okay. Like, I'm, I'm not exactly a gun guy. So I have to get a guy who can help me with, sure. with the gun stuff, with the Jesse books. I, I'm very lucky to have a dear family friend who's a police chief in a small Massachusetts town. And so my friend, John Fisher, he has walked me through procedural stuff that is way, way, way above my, uh, my pay grade. And like in this book, in Payback, I had to learn about poker, okay? I, I suspect that you are probably about as good a card player as, as I am, okay? I Which do know how to play poker, I will say that. I'm not, not that I'm any good at it or was any good at it. I haven't played in a while, but I probably, I, I know that, I, I know the number of cards in a deck and all that. Yeah, no, I do too. And, and I also had to learn a little bit about hedge funding, which is completely, oh. no, it might've been like, I was like learning Sanskrit, okay? But I have a dear friend who was a hedge fund guy and he walked me through the money stuff. And then, you know, you, you haven't gotten to this point in the book yet, but Barbara will tell you there's a point in this book, right, Barbara, where the two stories that seem completely disparate for Sonny suddenly intersect. And amazingly, and yes, huh? wonderful. Amazingly, they intersect and we are on. Can I can I refer back to something that you were just talking about? Because it's one of the reasons I really like what you're doing, is that you know, you don't have a static Boston. I mean, we all knew the places that Spencer liked in Boston. Bob had a vision of Boston and it yeah. was his Boston. And I really love the way that you're updating that. Um, you know, Ace does it too, and the Spencers, but um, you know, it, you can't stay in Bob's universe forever. You can write the characters right. and all, but you do have to move it along. And I think you've done a great job of showing us how Boston is, you know, modernizing, changing. Well, yeah, urban, all cities do that all the time. And I, I love that feature in the book that they go to places. I mean, what is it? What was the restaurant that Spencer loved so much? Lock Over, was that it? Oh yeah, oh sure, yeah. And, and I think it's gone now. Yeah, it is. And, and, and you so, know, that's, that's just like heart-wrenching if you're a Spencer fan and you know, you think you're gonna read Spencer and it's gonna be your guide to Boston um, and it's no longer there. So I think it's really important that you're updating the city. Um, it's funny, Barbara. Um, it, it, there, there's a there's a bar, the old Ritz on Arlington. Yeah, and New exactly. Okay. Bob obviously loved it. I I had you know I I met him there more than one time, and and then it became the Taj. Okay, and it's about to reopen now is the Newberry. But that bar, it, it to me that was one of the capitals of Bob's universe. Okay, so Sonny loves that bar, and Sonny meets you know. 
Wayne Cosgrove, the columnist there. And, and, and so that place, um, th there's certain points of light in, in what Ace calls the Parker sphere, okay? That I wanted to use, but then I wanted to expand it into my Boston and places that I think are interesting and, and geography that I think expands Sunny's world a little more um, as, as, she's, as she's aged. Yeah, but Carl made a great point, which is that Miami, it would be harder to, I'm trying to think, I think it would be harder to capture Miami in that same way than it, than it is Boston. For one thing, Boston's fairly compact. That's right. You know, you it's, could not, walk. It, it's a walking city and there's always a little more texture, I think. In Miami, you're on one, one expressway or another. Uh, and, and, you know, and like a lot of big cities, I mean, a lot of cities that have, are sprawl cities, you know, right. it's, it's not the same. And uh, you can certainly capture moments in neighborhoods, but there's something uh, comforting about, uh, you know, uh, having a character walk down a street that's two, 250 years old versus, you know, sitting on an expressway that just got five lanes last year. You know, I mean, it's different. It's just a different feel for it. Yeah, and, and again, you know, I've expanded it to part the, the parts of Boston where Sonny's former father-in-law, Desmond Burke, the Irish mob lives. And, and you know, another capital of the Parker sphere is, 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 is uh, Buddy Fox, where Tony Marcus has his office in the back. And, and you know, once you get these characters talking, it, it, that's what Dutch, you know, you know this, Carl. Dutch used to say, I'd say, what, what do you do? He said, I just put them in a room and get them talking and hope that some interesting stuff, uh, like I consider you a great plotter. I, 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 I will say in this book, there's, there's a pretty good surprise in the, whenever I, whenever I come up with what I consider a good surprise, Carl, the most surprised person is me. Okay. Right, but see, what, what about all those index cards? I, I can tell but you. But they don't, none of it ever makes it into the book. None they're of it props. ever makes they're, it. They're total props. So to bother you, to upset you. you. Your podcast or whatever you do, and you can, so this is what writers <laughs> do. And they're not, there's not, you, they're probably at the, the public's grocery list that you've got behind you. Because if you shouldn't have any, you've got that many index cards, you shouldn't have any surprises. You know, you know how it's going to end, but but that half the fun is not knowing what their character is going to do. And I, I mean, you don't want it. I had a, I had a, a an author who was a friend of mine <laughs> tell me one one time that he knew he knew how he knew the last line of the book before he wrote the first. Oh no, I'm not that guy. No, no, I'm not him. And then no. what's the then my answer is what's what's the point there? No, no. Where's, where's the fun in that? All of my outlining turns to be in vain, okay? I, here's how I describe what I do sometimes. I write myself into a locked room and then somehow try to write myself. Exactly. Uh, uh, you know this. There was a point in the book, I, the Jesse, I just finished, where I've, I've got a wonderful air, uh, editor, Sarah Minich, and, and I'll, I'll call her and I'll say, okay, this is a 911 spitballing call. And I will literally start pacing and talking. And it's out of that conversation, I'll, I'll get something that, that you know, it, you know this. I'm very, uh, I'm not the guy who goes up the hill and comes back with the book. I, I'm always talking it through with, with, you know, with the people I'm getting information from. And I'm, I'm very verbal in, in, in the writing of these books because somebody, you know, I used to, before I used to start every book, I used to go sit with my friend, the great William Goldman in, in his apartment in New York City. You know it, the greatest, the greatest bachelor apartment maybe in the history of, of New York City. And I would just say, okay, here's what I want to do. And, and this is where I sort of think it's going to go. And, and then we would spitball. And, and Goldman said the first rule of spitballing was this. You cannot edit yourself. You have to be willing to say any dumb thing that comes out into your head because that dumb thing may never find it into the book, but it may touch off something right. that, that gives you, uh, do you know what I mean? It's I know, I know exactly. I wish I had your, you know, I'm a, as you know, my social skills are, are 
vastly diminished and i don't i think they've improved though but it's a little you know what i but i don't talk to anybody about any i don't talk to anybody about i'm paranoid about not paranoid that the ideas are going to get stolen i'm paranoid that someone's just going to say well that's the shittiest idea i ever heard and then then you have crushed you can't move forward you know yeah but see goldman said you've got to be willing to say that you've got to be willing to open yourself up to humiliation Yeah, I guess, but I, I still, but that's what you, but that's what I'm talking about. You, you're, you're all the way to the end, right? Writing your way out of the room is the best description I've heard. Um, and it, it's because it, you do write yourself. And I don't know, there's not Paul or someone, there was the great quote about uh, a, a, one, a very distinguished novelist who said, well, and they said, how far ahead do you plot? Is oh, the God. whole book plotted out? And he said, no, it's like driving a car. You ride as far as your headlights. Right. And shine. Right. And, and I don't then, know. I think it might have been Dr. O. I think it might have been Dr. O. It's oh, like going like down, anyway, going was, down a dark it's, road. It's, and and, it's, and it, yeah. that's what I found. Yes, that's exactly it. How far can you see that particular on that day you're riding? How, what's the distance you can get to and still have it make sense? And it's always a struggle. But I think it, because I think this kind of a novel, which is that has to be plotted crisply because it moves so fast. I think there's more pressure on you. I can meander all over the place because my readers know that I'm not a well person and that, that this is just some sort of psychotherapy for me. But you, the expectations for you coming in with, with the Parker and, and, the, and with Jim Patterson too. I mean, you, you got a legion of, legions of legions of, of fans and readers who are, are, read, are every line is going to be examine and every bit of dial you know that they're just and they'll catch you if you make one mistake they will catch your ass you know that oh yeah no but working especially working with jim it's it's like a master class in moving stories along i mean people don't who don't appreciate his his ability as a storyteller they're, they're like watching the wrong movie and that's helped me with with the parker books it really has and yeah but you know at, at the end it's what dutch always used to say you write the book to find out what happens i mean exactly. that's that that's and and that's exactly. no matter how much i think i know it never ever ever i i never stay in my lane okay and and with the surprise that i was talking about with barbara before those are the fun days of being an, when, when that, when something happens and I literally did not know that this thing was going to happen until it happened. And it, it, then you think, okay, this, this is a, this is a pretty cool uh, job. Alan Bennett once said that the, the fun of writing fiction is you find out that you know things that you didn't know you knew. And it, it constantly happens with me, especially writing mysteries. Such an interesting point. You know, I've talked a lot with Bob. He used to come out here. We used to drink and bemoan the fact that the Red Sox and the Cubs, that neither one of us would ever live long enough to <laughs> see one yeah. it. And fortunately, he did. And eventually, I have. So yes. that's exciting. Uh, but, you know, Mortal Stakes was the book that really blew me away from Parker. I think it's his third Spencer. And I'm telling you, I never could imagine how he was going to bring it off. I care. I, you know, I read it and I think there is no way he's going to write himself out of this situation. And I think he must have written like you. I mean, he was a, an organite, well, you know, a professor and all that other stuff. But Mortal Stakes was the one where I thought he really put himself up there on a high wire. And, you know, I often wonder if he knew how he could get out of it until, until he did. Yeah, he, and, and, you know, when you, when you go back and I've, I've probably read everything he's written three or four times and, you know, the, the relationship between Spencer and Hawk, for example, how that evolved from promised land on where, where Hawk was the bad guy. Okay. And, there's something that I, I think I've pulled off and I think you're gonna like in the new Jesse book where I bring Crow back and and Crow and Jesse kind of become an unlikely partnership in, in dealing with what's going on in paradise. And it's funny when you talk about Boston and Miami and all that stuff, the challenges of paradise, Massachusetts, a fictional town are, are uh, uh, an entirely different set of challenges for me because I can kind of put in any sort of geographical landmark I, I want to. And, and I'm just always trying to remember, okay, 
the ocean has to be over here and you know the west of there is other stuff and and uh and it's uh it's 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 interesting how he was able to keep all of those plates spinning sunny jesse spencer the the westerns he was he was just a giant of this of this craft and imagination and talent and you know we talked about this before the day i found out he died it was like it's like when I heard that Will Chamberlain had died. It, he was like Superman. I said, that can't possibly happen. Well, I'll be interested to see what you do with Jesse, because Jesse, to me, is the lone wolf in the Parker sphere. You know, I mean, Spencer clearly is not. Um, and Sunny has ambivalence, uh, where she's, you know, both in and out all the time. But to me, Jesse really is more like, you know, like a Western. He's more like the gunslinger in his own way. He just which, is a, which is the way he's described multiple times yeah. in the book I just in the book I just finished. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, I I liked Parker's. I thought Reed did some interesting things, but it'll be fun to see what you do with it. Yeah, it was the first one was was Fool's Paradise was really I was so pleasantly happy. You know, I was su not surprised, but I was really happy with how the first Jesse uh, was received and and. Uh, it, but again, it's 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 an interesting set of challenges, and and when I look at that his bibliography, you know, when I see the the list of what this man did, it first of all, yeah, you see, Hyson, you know, go, go and look at the, at the in the first pages of these books, and look how much Bob. I don't think you made fun of Mr. Parker the way you make fun of Mr. Uh, Mr. Lupica, do you, Mr. Hyson? No, no, I don't think you do. <laughs> well, he, he didn't open himself up the way the the way you did you know i mean the way you do i mean you you're very open and but i mean i've you know i've i've seen your workspace and i just it boggled my mind i had to bring it up because most of your readers aren't aware of of the of the full organization that that you present and i do i think you do it just to to disarm your friends who are writers your other friends just to throw them off their game for a couple of days i wish you know what if i wasn't afraid that i'd somehow disconnect this whole evening i would take this over there and i would take you over to the cork boards and and you would see the disorganization of my writing table and 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 the cork boards where i just try to at least put a few thoughts up there so i can retain them until the next day well no, I, I have little scraps of paper and stuff, but I'm not, you know, I mean, I'll, and then the idea will come in, I'll literally like I'll write it on a post-it note, and then I'll forget where I put the damn post-it, you know, I mean, and I'll, it's just pathetic. It really is pathetic. It's a miracle anything gets done, but, uh, um, but see, I mean, you're already like thinking projects ahead, you know, I mean, aren't you? You're already like, you're, you're already telescoping. Uh, you could tell us like what a year from now you'll be writing. No, no, I, but I, I, no, I, but no, I, again, J Jim Patterson and I have this book coming out in January about the world of, of, of horse show jumping. Which oh, no, let's just, let's just, now let's, let me just stop you right there because it's probably something else your readers don't know. And I, I, I've ascribed oh, here this. We here, I was, we here we go. Here we go. I have ascribed this incredible produ productivity and motivation that you have to your your just your journalism background, your your muscle reflex. But the truth is, if I owned horses the way you do, I, horse, I, no, I, not horses, not horses, horse, one yeah, horse. The, then the there's the leasing, there's the rest. I, I I went, you know, all I'm saying is I'd be up at dawn writing too. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. It is. It is. It is. No, I'll be writing. No, no. I'll be writing till, till I just <laughs> forward one day. And, and, and then, you know, you'll probably show up and say, maybe I can finish this. Well, I told you, I said, you picked an animal that eats all night while you're sleeping. Well, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then my daughter, my precious little angel, she turned out to be great. So, you know, and now when friends of mine, Barbara, when friends of mine say, oh, I'm, I'm sending my little girl to pony camp. I go, no, 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 no. Get her a lacrosse stick, you know, get her a soccer ball. <laughs> my sons who aren't nearly as funny as they think they are, will come in sometimes with, with a soccer ball and they'll say, dad, this, this, does this cost as much as, as a horse did? Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I feel like such an idiot. I thought, of course, you mentioned this right before we started. Um, I thought you were just tweaking me when you said you had a book coming out with Patterson in January. I, I swear to you, I didn't realize that. Oh, no, this is, I just, this is I a feel big so deal. deal. No, the books. Tell us a little more about it. Honestly, I really thought you were just like. Oh, no, this 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 was this this happened quite randomly. Uh, um, Jim and I met. And, and had a breakfast at his diner in, in New York State. And he, he just loved the idea of this world that my daughter's in because men can compete against women, older people, younger people, it doesn't matter, okay? It's just you and the horse. And we constructed this story about uh, a young woman, a champion rider, her mother's a champion rider, the grandmother owns the barn and it's an Olympic year and it's, it was as much fun as anything I've, I've ever done working with Jim. And, we're and now not, not that anyone from the IRS would be watching this program, but um, you know, you you early on uh, inquired about no, 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 no about no. the po po this 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 your knowledge of the sport and how much of it you could possibly deduct. And I was trying to advise you. Uh, I don't think that's this is. I don't think this is a path. <laughs> That we need to go down, but Barbara, look, get, getting back to your can, can you mute him, Barbara? Are you able to mute him? Um, no, no and, only and, Patrick can do that. And no, oh, I'll, I'll back off. I'll and back. we are now we're now about three quarters of the way into another one too. We're having a ball. Are you and Patterson again? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay, and what well, is this? I'm, this is a golfing one. If you no, had... no, no, no. I'm not. No, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, but it's fun. We're having fun. All and right. I've learned, I've, it's like getting a master class. It's great. So, Carl, since we've asked Mike, what are you working on? Is it anything you could talk about, or you just want to draw a veil over it? Um, I, I'm, I'm working on another kid's novel, and um, my superstitions are that I can't, I never really talk about it because I'm afraid to jinx it, but um, it, 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 I'm, I'm excited about it. It's a, I think it's a good story. I, I wish. I knew uh, where it was going, but maybe I don't. Um, but I'm just, I'm, I, since I stopped the column in mid-March, the newspaper column, and I was only doing one a week. Mike, Mike always wrote, he wrote more than that, and I did for a while, but since I've stopped that, I've, I've done a lot of fishing and goofing off. So now I, this is why I'm feeling like a sloth when I, whenever I talk to him, we have these conversations about, because, <laughs> but here you have to understand something. The first thing he'll say to me, and I'll just call him up for a friendly conversation is, Oh, I just sent off another manuscript. Yeah, see, that's just simply not true. That's just not true. But, or you don't talk very often. That could, that could be no, the only thing. No, 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 I'm telling you, every it's every couple of months, he's they're they're flying from from Florida to New York, and uh, but uh, you know, I'm so I'm working away at my own modest pace, and uh, you know, I I just got to sort through. It's the, you know the. I start, I don't know, and, and I, I start with just a, a cast of characters that I, I mean, like Judge used to, that you like, that you want to see on a stage. There's, you, right. you, you fall in love with the characters first, you just sort of throw them on this little stage in your brain and see what happens. And that's, you know, that's at the stage I'm at now, they're all sort of colliding and things and we'll figure it out. But but I think, again, getting back to, to, to the Parker series, Sonny Randall, all those, you're, I think it would be incredibly challenging. I mean, you're dealing with not just a known and and and, and much loved character, uh, and every time out, you got to set them off in a new direction and bring the bring the people who care about them along with you. And that's a hell of a lot harder than it sounds. It is not easy. Yeah. It it what what I obviously plot story is important you you these books are being read by really smart people who are who are trying to you know think ahead of you and be a couple of steps ahead of you but you know i've talked about this with barbara whether i was talking about my, my first jesse book or the sunny book you have got to want to hang out with sunny for 300 and 25 pages. You gotta, you gotta want to find out what her dad is doing, what Spike is doing. You know, but that first scene I told you about, she's sitting with Spike and she said, she asked him if 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 he thinks she's getting older. And he says, This is a trap. And it, she said, No, the UPS kid manned me yesterday. And Spike said, I assume you shot him. And and I'm Carl, literally from that moment on, I said, Okay, I feel like I'm in the room with them now. You know, that that I had heard them talking with each other, and now I I was in charge of these conversations, and and 
whether it's Richie or Tony Marcus or Vinnie Morris, who's another great bad, sort of semi bad guy in these books, um, you got to want to hang with them. Okay. But you, the, the, the readers have history with them too. And so you have to honor that history. But fortunately for me, honoring that history, it's, it's in my DNA because I've read and loved all of these books for so long. And, and also you knew, you knew Parker and that, that yeah. made the world a difference too. It isn't just the respect that you had for him, but you, you heard how he spoke of his own characters and you had, you talked the way writers do over a lunch or dinner or something. And when, once you kind of have that experience and you absorb that, I, I think, I think it makes you much better qualified to, to tackle those kind of oh. iconic figures. Yeah, Carl, one you know, time. If, oh. you knew, if you knew Bob, you also knew that Joan and Susan Silverman had, you know, genetic links. And the other thing I, I always thought was so wonderful about Bob was how proud he was of his two sons. And one of them, well, both of them were gay, but one of them, I think, was an actual, wasn't he a ballet dancer? Yeah. I think? Something yeah. like that. Yeah. And so when I think about Spike, I think about Bob. I mean, he wrote Hawk before any, any idea of cultural appropriation entered the universe. So he was able to write Hawk, you know, without anybody giving him that kind of um, critique. But writing Spike, I always felt that he was writing really authentically, you know, ab about Completely. it. And, and Barbara and, and Lee Farrell, uh, who's a, a yeah, great exactly. cop in these books, who's essential to the plot of, of Payback. There he is. Also okay. right. and, 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 and so it's, no, no, it's, it's his, 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 um, his worldview was just tremendous. His it was, but he had room for everybody in it. That's the part that's that was no. so great. And at the time that he did it, nobody was going to, you know, give him any difficulty about embracing all those characters. And one of the things I find so hard today is that, you know, you have to, there's pressure on writers to be what they're writing about, which I think is bullshit. I mean, you know, fiction's fiction. You're supposed to be able to make it up. And um, I, found, I had a really interesting dialogue with the New York Times book review the other day when I wrote to say, come on guys, you know, there's way too much not fun stuff in here. Why can't we have more reviews of genre fiction? You know, Sarah Weinman and I just did a program about reviewing with Patrick, who's a great reviewer and writes for Pub Publishers Weekly and so forth. Several of my staff, three of my staff are major reviewers, one for Library Journal, one for Booklist, and Patrick for PW and so forth. And we had a real discussion about, you know, criticism at the moment. You know, what, what should we be talking about? And should we bring in all these social issues? So should we just look at the book? And, you know, I mean, Carl, if you're doing a guy with a weed whacker, you know, you're not getting cultural appropriation because no. probably he's the only one that has an arm that's no, a weed but I mean, I've, had, I've had the conversations because in several of my novels, there's there's the, the protagonist, the, the lead protagonist is a woman and going all the way back to, to, to you know, strip tease. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I've had the occasional conversation where how could you write from a women's point of view? And I, and I'm, and, 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 and I mean, and, and there's really no answer to that except my job is if you're a fiction writer, if you, can, if you are only restricted to your own life and your own experience right. and you can't use your imagination or you can't use the relationships that you've had and the people that you've known, then you're out of business. I mean, I mean, it's just, it is, it is, it's baloney. No, you don't know. Exhibit, no, no, no. No. <laughs> Exhibit A is the main character in this book. I mean, the, the, and and I I don't think anybody said oh how you just completely buy into this woman's you know it's it's a sense of attitude and humor and 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 toughness and Taylor my wife has been telling me for years that I should be writing you know main women characters so I'm now doing it with Sunny and 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 we did it with um with all of the characters pretty much in the Horsewoman. So you yeah, guys are, are iconic. Right? Sorry. It, I mean, it's it's all a tight wire act. I mean, I mean every every care you how homogenous and dull would the books be if every if every novelist was restricted to if you, there were boundaries to who or what you could write about. I mean, right. I if I want to if I want to write about a Montana cowboy, I'll do some research and I'll write a I'll write about a cowboy. And in right. and, and the last kids book that uh, there was a, a there was an, a, a a girl that was Native American in there, and I did a hell of a lot of research and we checked a lot of things, all of that. 
point is you want to put someone on page, like Mike said, that you care about. A, that's the main thing. If the readers don't care about the character, it doesn't matter how accurate or what, anything or how precise. They've got to they've got to care about the character, and they want to they've got to want to hang out with them. All that is the key. Our job, and this is what we learned in the newspaper business, from the you got to you, in in the old days you you wanted to make them what we call turn to the jump page. If the story starts on the front page, you got to be writing well enough to make them turn to the jump page and right. read the rest of it. Right. In, in the world of fiction, in the world that we inhabit, um, you've got to make them just turn the next page. And if you, it doesn't matter if, if they're not interested, they're not into the characters, you fail. You, you just failed at your job because our job is to entertain in that way. But you know, Carl, Carl, you're I talking was... about two different things, which I find really interesting. One is that are they just boring? You know, because that's a big problem. But the other is, you know, you have to, as you say, you have to, there has to be somebody in the book that you like. You know, and, and one of the reasons I don't like this domestic suspense genre all that well is that everybody, there's nobody to like, you know, it's just, right. um, and, and I find them increasingly depressing to read because, you know, you don't want to think about the whole world being full of people that, um, that you can't trust that are there to do you in, your family, whatever it might be. So, you know, one of the reasons... I'll tell you what, I'm going to call Patrick up like, you know, I love it when he becomes Ariel here coming out of the deep. But one of the reasons that I always love Barker is no matter what my personal mood or mindset was, you could pick up a Bob Parker and just escape right into it. Yes. It was always joy. Yeah. It was, you know, he, he didn't trivialize things. He wrote about social issues and all the rest of it. But it was just a pure moment where you could step out of your life and step into Bob's world and his dialogue and Lou. So I used to say them as treats to pace myself, you know, because um, I mean, I'm looking right over here at like 400 arcs I have to read or at least look at in the next couple of months. And I would get a Parker and then I would say to myself, if I do this many books, I could give myself permission to read a Parker, you know, because it was going to be so wonderful. Patrick, do we have questions? Uh, yeah, we do, but I just wanted to, to mention, I have a distinct memory, Barbara, of uh, flying on an airplane uh, with you. I think we were going to Alaska for one of the voucher con or something, and uh, you were reading the advanced reading copy of a new Parker on the plane. Yeah. I got some crazy uh, hair going, sorry. And uh, <laughs> and I just remember you laughing, uh, reading this uh, this ARC, and when, you know the, the the margins got bigger, the space between the you know, and just what an artist he was uh, he till the very end. He didn't a lot of room to tell a great story, did he, Carl? I've always thought that was a great asset to, to Parker. People criticized him sometimes, you know, for too few words or something, but every word worked. Yeah, it's almost easier to write, to write, to, to pad. I know, I think Michael agreed with that. I mean, I've read, and you know, you get enough of these, you know, these galleys and the proofs, and you start reading right away, and there's just, you could, it, we have an inner editor and you're sitting there waiting to just start slicing away. This is right. way right. too much, you know, yep. and it, it slows it down. I'm, I'm, I, you're right. I have a question okay. from, yeah, I have a question from Patty and she says, uh, question for Carl. Skink is such an extreme, <laughs> larger than life and beloved character. Was it a challenge to make him remain extreme in comparison to the totally imaginary, couldn't be real president in Squeeze Me. <laughs> it, it, it was because as time has passed, the reality, it, I think, makes it harder for all of us who write satire for a living. The reality of the last few years has, has is eclipsed anything you could have imagined. So yeah, it was a challenge. But in the, and I kind of only bring Skink out in, on perfect occasions. And because uh, I was writing about the pythons, which of course are real in South Florida, yeah. I needed just, I thought he, I needed someone who could curate a large number of big pythons. And it just, this is a literary decision, obviously. And I said, who's, who's going to be a python guy? And I just brought, yeah, but it is, I think it was the same with the column. I mean, if, if you're trying to write a satirical column, how do you, how, how do you stay ahead of the curve of, of, of what's happened the last couple of years? And I think it was true in that, in my book, last book. I mean, I, every day I picked up the paper and I dreaded the headlines thinking this is going to whatever is going to happen is going to be sicker than anything I could have invented. 
Um, okay, uh, Patty also has a question uh, for Mike. She says, how much time did Mike spend in Boston and Cambridge uh, to, to locate some of the scenes for these books? Well, I, Patty, I went to Boston College in the 1970s and I didn't plan to spend, to send four of my children through the school, but that's just the way it evolved. So when I started my career, I wrote and lived in, in Boston. And I, I think I have spent over time covering sports events and visiting my children. I've spent a year of my life since then walking around Boston. So Bar Boston is completely a, 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 a part of, of my uh, DNA. I'm on my way there in, in, two, in 10 days to, to, to walk it again for three or four days um, in the run up to my daughter graduating. Wow. Um, here's an interesting question kind of related to what you were both just talking about. Uh, she, the, the customer says, uh, I think he's captured the voices, Mike that is, of both Sonny and Susan Silverman. And, and I don't imagine that was easy. How did he manage to not only write similarly to Parker, but also to get into the mindset of two such distinctly different women? I um, have, I'm very lucky to, um, uh, to be married to someone who's really smart and, 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 and I have a 22 year old daughter who's really smart and I have um, a literary agent who's really smart. And so I've found Patrick that if I don't write good, strong, funny, smart women characters, my life becomes extremely difficult. Okay. It becomes extremely difficult. And, and, and so, and so Susan Silverman was a blast to write. Okay. And she's usually in two or three scenes with Sonny and the back and forth to me is, is, is it's, it's like a tennis match. Okay. It's like a bloodless boxing match between the two of them. And the, those have been, it, Patrick, I'll just say this to you because you, you are a, a master of understanding the stories like this. Okay. Sometimes I have to say to myself, don't send Sonny over there, okay? You, you keep this story going, hold on, we'll bring Susan out of the bullpen when we need her because those scenes are so stupidly fun to write. I, I sometimes feel like I have to rein myself in from, from uh, having too many of them in the book. I have a quick question for Carl. Uh, I have to ask you about Team Rodent. Um, <laughs> can you talk? <laughs> I mean, what a gutsy book to write. That was not, yeah, that was nonfiction. It was just, it was, it's been a few years that um, the, uh, my publisher was doing a series of very distinguished, uh, he had uh, Jimmy Carter doing it, but everybody was doing this and it was about 25,000 words. And they said, is there, is there anything you can write that you could really get worked up about in 25,000 words of, of nonfiction? And I said, well, I could do Disney because they're right over there. And, um, and so- Carl, look what I'm holding up. I see that. That's the one that Pete wrote, yep. News the Verb. This, this, this is the size of these books that Carl's talking about. Right, so we all got, and, and so Esther, our agent said, why don't I give it a try? And I said, I mean, it's, it's just gonna go nuts. Cause I, and I was starting it at, I think I started the book in Times Square where the Disney, one of the Disney, yeah had just opened and I was, and there was, there was still some adult establishments that surrounded this, uh, this children's play. And I just thought found the dichotomy. So I got this, and the whole object was to get banned from Disney World. I did not I, <laughs> take my, my young son at the time back to, I, and I'd heard you could get banned. And I thought, if I write this book, I'll never have to go back to that place. And, um, and they were too smart uh, to, be, and in fact, I had to go back there to do with a writer to do a, a to, to when I was promoting the book, it actually backfired because I had to go back in the game. <laughs> what what kind of legal what kind of flack did you get from the the Disney mafia? I if I got any, I didn't. I I uh, seldom pay attention to the flack I'm getting. So I I don't I understand that the book was not for sale on Disney property anywhere. Um, <laughs> And I, and I did hear that Michael Eisner, who was the head of the company at the time, had, uh, professed that he did, had not read the book because it came out at the same, about the same time as his autobiography. <laughs> and I didn't design that. 
but he'd asked for an advanced manuscript of my little book and uh, my uh, editor, Peter Gathers, politely declined. And, uh, and then I heard he's, he said he read it anyway and didn't like it. And again, for someone with a newspaper background, that is the highest badge of, uh, you, what you worry about is when they like it, then you're worried. Patrick, I, I have a great Michael Eisner story that is apropos of nothing we're talking about tonight, but there's a famous story about when the late John Gregory Dunn met, um, was gonna have lunch with Michael Eisner. And he couldn't imagine what they could possibly talk about. And all he could think about was to say to Eisner when he met him, you know, I recently had the same heart surgery that you had. And Eisner immediately said, mine was more serious. <laughs> it's a great story. I love it. Love John Gregory Dunn, too. I mean, that that uh, true confession. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Good job. He's Los dumb. Angeles, you know. Yeah. Just, Classic. No, no. That, that, yeah. that was a pretty talented marriage, wouldn't you say? I think it was. Man. Joan Didion, yeah. 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 And the movie version of that was pretty damn good, he uh, I thought. Great. He was yeah. great. Yep. Yep. Um, let's see a question. Let's. Uh, okay, for either or both of you, what's your favorite book of the past year? Uh, and whose books do you read obsessively? Well, I. <laughs> I loved Squeeze Me. I mean, Squeeze Me wow. is is Hyacinth's best book. Hyacinth's like, he, no. he gets embarrassed when I say this. He's like our Mark Twain, okay? And so so Squeeze Me, and then, and my buddy Joey Day, I, I love the IQ books. I, I, I he is, right, right, Carl, he is a dazzling, he's a yeah. dazzling talent, okay? I, I uh, if, if he heard me say that, he could call up and say something mean about me, but I, 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 I love Joe Ide's books and I, I always look forward to a new IQ. This is to me, and, and Carl and I have talked about this, IQ to me is one of the most interesting characters, you know, Sherlock Holmes in, in the hood is just one of the most interesting characters that's come along in years. Well, Patrick agrees with you. He's a huge Joe Ide fan. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really fresh, really unique. And it's a crowded field too. I mean, those are that's tough to break in with characters like that right now. And I mean, and I, I, he, it's just so unique. It's such a great, a great voice. Yeah, I mean, it's exciting when you read something. You know, when you when you read like the first one that comes along, you think, that, okay, now now we're onto something. And there's a real sly, subtle, you know, social critique going yeah. on underneath a lot of those books and i there's one other there's there's a there's a couple um that um and it, it and, and this has you know anybody knows me knows i'm not i'm not looking to to panhandle for anything um the books that um uh uh jim patterson has written with david ellis the black book and the red book i really i'm reading the red book right now i that chicago cop billy harney is a great character that has has pulled me into that world David's a wonderful writer. Yeah, no, it's, I, I really, I, I really, you know, I mean, I like Alex Cross. I love the Alex Cross books, but the, the Red Book was a worthy successor to the, uh, to the Black Book. Um, you, you both have written books for young readers. Uh, do you, how does your approach change when you're, when you're writing for the a younger audience? Is it, well, uh, is it very different or? Yeah, Patrick, let me just tell you it's something that that Carl's friend Taylor Lupica said when when Travel Team became a, a big success, my first book for, for young readers. She said, honey, let, let's face it, you writing from inside the mind of a 12 year old seems like pretty much a perfect fit, um, as far as I can tell. And it's just nice that you can use your immaturity now to help the family. I. I, I'm probably more, uh, it, it's easier for me to write from inside the mind of a child than it is a hard-nosed detective. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a lot more, you, you start with a, a clean slate. The characters don't have the baggage. You can hit the ground running and the kids are just the greatest readers. But I, I agree with Mike. I mean, I think we're adolescents at heart. We, uh, it's a cleaner world, a more pure world. And the great thing about writing young characters like that is they have an, a, a, an instant and infallible sense of what's right and wrong. They're, they're not muddled in the way that your grown up, you know, you, 
in, in my book, you'll have a character like, you know, uh, four divorces and a meth habit. You don't have to do that as kids, but right. you just have these great kids and they're running and they're, they're, they're doing kid stuff. And it, to me, it's a, it's a nice breather. It's a, it's, 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 you take a deep breath. And then the letters that you get from kids, as Mike knows, are just, they just blow you away. They're just, they're sharp, they're funny, they're blunt, <laughs> but they, that's why you keep writing as you hear from, you hear from young readers and you just say, well, I'm never going to stop this. No, I'm not, I can't stop writing. I did a school appearance the other day um, down, I'm, I'm down in Florida right now. And I, I always start out by Patrick and, and Barbara by saying the same thing. I, I tell the kids, listen, I have to tell you a pretty sad story about when Mr. Lupica was your age, because when Mr. Lupica was your age, there was no ESPN. And they all scream. And then I say, there was no Google. There were no laptops. There was no internet. And they're all screaming, thinking, oh my God, it sounds like he was little Harry Potter growing up underneath the stairs, okay? But then I tell them that we're exactly the same because we, we, we both like a good story. And I said, with all the magic and science and technology that you have now, there's still no greater adventure than page one, chapter one of a book you really want to read. And then- okay. Then the challenge is the same, whether it's it's Carl and Squeeze Me or Sonny Randall, keep them turning the pages to find out what, what happens next. It, that never changes, whether whatever kind of book you're writing. And the other thing that we both lived long enough to understand is that the books we wrote when we were younger for kids, I, now you go to a book signing for, well, you, if you go for this book, you're going to have somebody at that book signing says, I, I, I started reading you when Travel Team came out. Right, so right. It, it makes yeah. you feel ancient and decrepit, but at the same time, I think that kind of loyalty, that's pretty cool that they stuck with you yes. all the years and, 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 and transitioned because, right. the, 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 you know, I mean, it's just, you, you, it makes you feel good about what you do when you, when you hear that. I'm so glad you said makes you feel ancient. We are doing an event for Jake Tapper on Tuesday. And the whole book is set with a Rat Pack in 1962. Ah. 1962 is the year I graduated from Stanford. My life has become an historical novel, which I am <laughs> not at all pleased about. And he has walking into it, two people. I grew up in Chicago, you know, went after North of Chicago. Rock Hudson is in this book, out, even though he's not out officially. He used to be my grandmother's mailman. And Margaret pops into this book. It was the year she made her first movie. She used to wear my clothes singing at New Trier because her family was so poor that um, she couldn't afford, um, you know, and, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to be talking about Jake. I mean, listening to Jake talk about this as though it was all centuries ago. That's really my life. Do you find that hard, guys, to realize that your life has turned into history? I, I think Carl and I have the same experience that the, when we're out and about now, people, somebody's, somebody who's far too old is going to be telling you that they were reading you when they were a kid. And, and you thank them, and then you just go home and cry yourself to sleep. And, right, right. <laughs> I mean, we're lucky to, look, at, we're, we, what we do, we're damn lucky to be doing what we do. Right. We're lucky to have readers who care about it. And I, Mike and I, have never taken any of this for granted. We're very fortunate. We've had good publishers, good editors, a great agent. Not all writers would sit here and tell you that story. Right. Both of us, uh, we can, we can, we'll survive the gray hair. The the, the thing is, that we're still going, and the way Parker kept going, and the way Dutch Leonard kept going. Not nobody ever stops this. Show. You just at some point, you just keel over into the keyboard, and and that's it. You're done. But nobody retires from this. This you can't. Barbara, I spoke to Elmore Leonard about three hours before he suffered the stroke that eventually killed him. And he was 87 years old at the time. And I used to talk to him three or four times a week. Carl, we, Carl, we, we both loved him. Carl worked on a book with him one time. He, it was a joy and a blessing to know him. But that day, he was so excited that he had decided to put Raylan into the book he was writing. And he was like a kid explaining to me how it was going to work and what Raylan had said in this first scene. And I could picture him sitting at that desk in, in that house in Birmingham Village. And, 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 and he was, he sounded like he was 18 years old. And, and uh, Barbara, I used to call him at four o'clock in the afternoon. 
And I'd say, are you writing or thinking about women? And he'd always giggle and say, what, you can't do both? That's such a great line. We ought to end on that, you know, because we can't really top it. He was a he was a wonderful man. We only saw him a few times at the bookstore, but um, but he was great. And I will tell you, we had a really funny story. Um, is that Random House managed to lose all of the books that were in some publicist's office that Elmar was going to sign for us, and so you know we were looking at a lot of angry fans about to do it. We oh. had this great customer who lived uh, practiced law and lived in uh, Detroit. And so I called him and I said, I have the most exciting news for you. What is that? He said, and I said, I have an opportunity for you to meet your favorite author. Well, he said, who could that be? Elmar Leonard, I said, and all you have to do is take a hundred books that I'm going to <laughs> ship to you and drive to his house and help him get them signed and he will be yours. But do you remember that, Patrick? Yeah, Bruce. Yeah, Bruce. Yeah, yeah, I know it was. And you know what? Bruce really did think it was like one of the highlights of his life that he would get to chuck our books across Michigan. <laughs> get them signed. So here we still are 32 years later doing it all. Anyway, thanks, guys. It's really been an absolute treat. Um, wonderful to see you both. I guess I'll see you in September, right? Um, um, me? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, you know you will see me in September. Always happy to see Carl, too. Um, thank you very, very much. And don't forget, we have autographed copies of Robert B. Parker's Payback, which is truly a fabulous book. And honestly, you don't, it would be fun if you'd read earlier Parker's, but you can read this if you've never read a Parker. And then you will want to go and a whole world will open up to you that you have not expected. What's, so. before, before we sign off, what's, what's, what are you working on, Carl? What's, what's next for you? I just, I says, I'm just working on another kid's book. I don't even have a title. I don't. Mm. Right. Uh, I'm not even sure I can remember where my office is most of the time. Hey, it's fine. No, I'm just I'm plugging. All, I've got nothing to plug. I've got nothing to sell. I'm except my except Mike's next book. He's probably got one coming out next. What's coming out next month? No, 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 <laughs> no, no. See, see that attitude. That attitude is not helpful. That is not helpful. Jesse will be out in September. Stone's oh. throw. There you go. Right. So it's September and then January. So it's good to know that we can pace ourselves for Lupica as we go the along. Lupica, the Lupica so, factory churns on and I have nothing to plug. But it's always fun. It's always fun talking with him. Thanks, he's Carl. A, Thank you, Carl. Friend. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Patrick. Talent. Go buy this book. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.